So now it is my distinct pleasure to start our program, and I get to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Nancy Davidson. Dr. Davidson is a world-renowned breast cancer researcher who serves as the president and executive director of the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, senior vice president and director of the clinical research division at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, and head of the division of oncology at the University of Washington. She was president of the American Society of Clinical Oncology from 2007 to 2008, and president of the American Association of Cancer Research from 2016 to 2017. Dr. Davidson earned her medical doctorate from Harvard Medical School and completed her internal medicine internship at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania and internal medicine residency at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Subsequently, Dr. Davidson completed a medical oncology fellowship at the NIH's National Cancer Institute. She was a faculty member in the Department of Oncology at the Johns Hopkins University of Medicine from 1986 to 2009, serving as the director of the breast cancer program from 1994 to 2009, and as the breast cancer research chair of oncology at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine from 1995 to 2009. And from 2009 to 2016, she served as the Hillman Professor of Medicine and Associate Vice Chancellor for Cancer Research at the University of Pittsburgh and Director of the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Davidson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a tremendous pleasure to be here at this inaugural symposium. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're thrilled that you can spend this time with us. So I want to tell you that this, these first couple of hours, the organizers have asked the three of us to think a little bit about where we've come in oncology generally and where we're going before we get down to the meat of the curriculum, which, as you know, has to do with cell-based therapy. So please know that Dr. Gilliland and I, um, he's the next speaker, we've split our time a little differently. So when I go over, you're going to know it's because I'm taking his time and he knows about that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about all of oncology uh, that's not based on cell-based therapy. You're going to hear from Gary about a lot of the work that has to do with immunotherapy because that's such an area of expertise for him. And then, as you know, our center is extremely well known for its bone marrow transplantation experience, and we're really fortunate that Fred Applebaum is going to think a little bit about that area with us before we come to the cell-based therapy. So. About half of you, I think, have joined us from out of town, and we are so happy to welcome you, and we hope that you will join us at the Bezos Center tomorrow. But just to tell you a little bit about us, um, the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. Um, our flagship uh, clinical building is the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance building that you see right here. Um, but we also work across the Seattle area at the University of Washington Medical Center for our, much of our inpatient care, Seattle Children's Hospital for our kids. Northwest Hospital and Evergreen Hospital, a little bit more out in our suburbs, and of course we have a proton therapy center as well. So all of these facilities are engaged in providing the best possible care and research options for our patients. We're growing. Um, you probably all are seeing this in your, uh, your own environment, but um, we've had the opportunity to serve ever more patients every year, um, thanks to the needs of cancer patients, thanks to the advances that we've been able to make, and we think thanks to our excellence as well. We're one team. Um, and we have many members, radiation oncologists, surgical oncologists, medical oncologists, our hematologists, our APPs, um, very important part of our workforce, uh, over 1,500 employees and a number of affiliated individuals as well. And so we all know um, that we are better together and that it does really take a team to undertake the kind of work that we are all engaged in. I also want to point out that we are the only National Cancer Institute designated comprehensive cancer center in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and so we have the opportunity um, through our affiliations to work across the five-state area. And you can see here the map that uh, demonstrates many of the practices and the groups with whom we work very closely across Alaska, Montana, Idaho, um, and the state of Washington. Now, with that, we are going to focus on immunotherapy today. Um, and this has been catalyzed at our own institution um, by the Bezos Family Immunotherapy Clinic. Um, and you'll hear more about this field over the next couple of days. 
um, and you will have the opportunity to visit this facility, which as you can see was dedicated um, just a couple years ago. And we're now at a point where we've been able to treat more than 235 patients who've been able to receive CAR T cell therapy. So we have one of the largest experiences with this particular modality in the nation. Now I want to think about cancer. So I want to step back and think about what's going on in the field of cancer, um, what's been accomplished over the last several decades, and then what's left, because there's much that's left for us to be able to do. And so I always like to start with some data. Um, and, and I'm very uh, drawn to these data. These are data that are actually uh, put together by the Institute for Health Metrics at the University of Washington, um, a group that's very into big data, um, and then trying to make it so it's accessible to you and me. And so what they did um, a year ago is they published a paper that looked at age-dependent mortality from cancer across the United States, county by county, um, in 2014. And then they graphed it in a way that you can see it's color-coordinated. So you can see that this uh, scale here, um, that the redder the area is, the more deaths per 100,000 people there are from cancer in that region of the country. The more blue you are, the fewer deaths. And I think the first thing we can see is that we have quite a variation um, across our country, um, particularly in the southeast part of the United States, there's a heavier burden of cancer mortality than we see farther west. But you can see that we have a lot of work left to do, um, that there's much that could be done to try to improve on this. This down here actually is color-coded to try to look at how things have changed over time. And so this particular graph, the red areas are the areas where they've had um, an increase in cancer mortality over the last several decades. The other area is a decrease, and you can actually see that graphed here, where in fact we can see that over the last couple of decades that we've seen a steady decrease in cancer mortality globally across the United States, but in a patchy fashion, as you and I just talked about. Well, that's all of cancer. What about different kinds of cancers? Um, my own personal interest is in breast cancer, same sort of graph. Um, you can see, again, a preponderance of deaths from breast cancer in the southeastern part of the United States, um, a little less in the west. You can see on that graph down here about changes, time frame, that in fact we've seen a decrease in breast cancer across many parts of the country, a decrease in, in breast cancer mortality. And that's really captured on this graph here, where you can see that the mortality has decreased very substantially between 1990 and the present time. You can also see, though, that we have a long ways to go before we get to zero. Now, what about a disease that's going to be of particular interest to this group as you think about cell-based therapy? Well, here's the information on non-Hodgkin lymphoma um, in the same time frame and across the United States. And you can see quite a different pattern, right? Big problem in the eastern part of the United States, the northeast particularly. Um, if you look at this time plot down here, you can see that actually age-adjusted mortality went up for a while, and now it's finally starting to drop. So I think this tells us about the dynamic nature of the various cancers that we take care of, and it certainly provides us with the thoughts about opportunities for us to try to improve on outcomes. Now, let's think a little bit about what we've accomplished in the areas that we might be able to have some impact over, and let's think a little bit about what might be left to do. So for a simple oncologist like me, I can think of several ways that we could try to close that gap, several ways that we could try to homogenize those maps so that they became ever more blue, as low as possible. Prevention, early diagnosis and screening, better treatment, and then the optimal use of what we already know. How do we put out, how do we implement the insights that we already have? So with regard to the area in prevention, this has obviously been a thrust um, at Fred Hutch um, for a very long time. Um, our institution on the Fred Hutch side is very focused on cancer prevention and screening. We've made some of the great insights um, that have come out of the, those areas in the last several years. But I think that we can capture this, um, encapsulate this into a few very simple things that are incredibly important for us to do. Um, obviously, the job of cancer prevention is to minimize the risk of developing cancer. The best cancer is no cancer, after all. And there's some pretty well-accepted strategies that we should all make sure that we are embracing with our cancer patients and with our cancer survivors. First and foremost, you know, we shouldn't forget what a scourge tobacco is, that eliminating tobacco use would be the single most important thing that we could do to change the landscape of cancer in this country and across the world. I think you probably also know that there's increasing information to suggest that alcohol use is, increases your risk of cancer. And so we need to be thinking about that for our patients and informing them about this emerging data. The importance of body weight is extremely well known to you. 
Um, cancers, several cancers are diseases where we can prevent them by virtue of vaccination. So make sure that we export vaccination for HPV and hepatitis B to try to prevent cervical cancer, head and neck cancer, and hepatocellular carcinoma couldn't be more important. And then for several very common kinds of cancers, we actually have chemo prevention strategies that are available. We have three FDA approved drugs that can be used to decrease the risk of getting breast cancer in women who are at high risk for getting breast cancer, and they're used by almost nobody. And that's a sadness, right? We've done all this information, we have all this information, and it's not being applied to our population. I want to touch briefly on tobacco, because I think sometimes we um, are a little limited in our thinking, and we think about tobacco and lung cancer. But you know what? There's a dozen different cancers that are associated with tobacco use. You can see them here. Various kinds of GU cancers, um, a variety of things wrapped around the head and neck, several things in the GI tract. And over there on the blood side, acute leukemia um, is associated with tobacco use as well. So reducing tobacco has a myriad of positive effects on the incidence of various kinds of cancers. Similarly, we understand now the important impact of weight of obesity in so many types of cancers. Um, and again, you can see the range of cancers in men and in women that are associated with obesity. Um, so that maintaining positive or normal BMI is so important. Um, esophageal cancer, liver cancer, gallbladder cancer, stomach cancer, lots of GI cancers, colorectal cancer, breast cancer in our postmenopausal women, and multiple myeloma, a disease, again, that's of particular interest to this audience as you think about CAR-T therapy. So trying to think about how we can help individuals control their body mass index and reduce obesity is going to be so important in decreasing the cancer burden. Now let's move to screening and early diagnosis. I know that everyone finds this a complicated area because we have ever-shifting guidelines, and I would like to suggest to you that that's a good thing. We would like to think that we are continuously doing research in these areas, that we are refining our understanding of the best ways to screen, and that we are then changing our guidelines to reflect that so that we can help the population at large. All the women in the audience will know that there has been continual refinement of the mammography guidelines um, to try to make them more in keeping with when women get breast cancer, which is in their older years, and try to think about the optimal spacing between mammograms. Uh, the women in the audience will also be grateful, as I am, um, that new insights have allowed us to recommend decreasing the frequency of pap smears and HPV testing so that most women don't need this but every three years and women can usually stop at the age of 65. So these are wonderful risk-associated guidelines that help us to try to optimize how we do this testing. Just this year, the threshold for colon cancer screening has been dropped to 45 in our country, and that's because of the increasing incidence of colorectal cancer in individuals between the ages of 45 and 50, so keep that in mind. A lot of discussion always about prostate cancer um, and PSA screening, and right now the recommendation is for shared decision-making. And of course, it's important that we institute lung cancer screening with low-dose CT scans for high-risk individuals, usually smokers. Treatment. Well, that's what we're here to talk about today, is, is really increases in treatment or better treatment. Um, and let's think about that in the context of what I think of as the five pillars of cancer care. Surgery, radiotherapy, cytotoxic chemotherapy, precision therapies, and immunotherapy. Of course, much of our time will be spent on immunotherapy. But I don't want you to minimize the importance of those other four areas as we think about the totality of the burden of cancer. And just as one example, one of the themes in surgery um, has been an ever greater refinement in the extent of surgery. In a field that I know well in breast cancer, thanks to evidence-based randomized clinical trials, we've been able to go from a point where surgeons routinely did radical mastectomies with very substantial surgery, as you see there, down to the point where at this point, most women with an early breast cancer can have a lumpectomy, have a sentinel node localization, and have some form of tailored radiotherapy as their therapy, a far cry from the days when we had to do radical mastectomies. And because of our understanding of cancer biology, better treatments um, in, can also be thought of in the, the context of precision or personalized cancer care, which you know is our goal right now. The notion that we can give the right treatment to the right person at the right time, and with the goals of maximizing efficacy, minimizing side effects, and minimizing cost, a, a, a topic that we'll come back to a little later. Now, none of this would have been possible without the amazing investment that was made by our federal government um, and by other funding agencies in fundamental basic science. 
And because of that, I think we now understand a lot about the hallmarks of cancer. And you can see this in this very well popularized wheel that reminds us about the variety of things that can go wrong with normal cells and normal tissues that predispose to cancer. Things like genome instability and mutation, things like evolution of the ability to become, become um, immortal, things like evading growth suppressors or evading immune detection. So these pathways are much better understood at this point, and because we have better understanding of these pathways, we can now think about ways that we can actually target them in a very specific way. We also understand that our disease labels are way too broad. Lung cancer, for example, our most common cancer and our biggest killer um, in the United States, actually comes in a whole variety of flavors. For a long time, we thought about small cell and non-small cell. We've now parsed it down even further. And to give you one example, here's adenocarcinomas of the lung. To remind you that thanks to molecular testing, we now know that there's a variety of different kinds of adenocarcinomas of the lung. About half of them have molecular mutations that we can uh, identify. Another half still remain to be elucidated. But this is incredibly important to us. That profiling needs to be done because we know from the get-go that if patients with lung adenocarcinoma have an EGF receptor mutation, they are candidates for certain targeted agents. If they have an ALK fusion in their tumor, they are candidates for different types of uh, targeted agents. This kind of refinement is incredibly important as we think about these big wastebasket diagnoses, if you will, like lung cancer, and we come down to the specific types of lung cancer. This is also true in another common epithelial cancer, in breast cancer. Here, thanks to transcriptional profiling, um, the ability to look at RNA expression across various kinds of breast cancers, we know that there are several molecular subtypes, as you can see here. And again, it's extremely important to us because we can alter, we can fine tune the way that we treat these women based on the kinds of findings that we have. So we know that those who have estrogen receptor positive disease should receive hormone therapy with or without chemotherapy. Those that have HER2 positive disease should receive HER2 therapy, perhaps with chemotherapy. And those who have the so-called triple negative disease, they don't have the estrogen receptor in their tumor, the progesterone receptor, or the HER2 protein. Those so-called triple negative patients are best treated with things like chemotherapy and perhaps some of the agents that are emerging like the PARP inhibitors. So lots of work going on, and I want to use breast cancer as one way of um, exemplifying this. Um, just to remind you that in this field, uh, estrogen receptor positive tumors are our most common type. Um, and even the best tumors, for a very long period of time, we've been suggesting to women that they should take hormone therapy plus chemotherapy. We came to realize there might be a lot of over-treatment there. And so that led um, to the proliferation of tests that are now available to us to try to help us to sort that out further. And you can see here just a handful of the tests that are on the market to try to help oncologists and patients sort out what to do about the use of chemotherapy and about the use of hormone therapy. In this setting, we want these tests to help us with prognosis. How's the patient going to do? We really want them to help us predict response to therapy, especially chemotherapy, yes, no. And sometimes we want them to help us to think about how long to give therapy. So these are very practical questions if you're a patient. Well, here's an example of one that's gotten a lot of press recently that I want to give you just as a thought about how we can develop these things across various tumor types. You probably read um, in the last couple of weeks about the refinement of the oncotype assay for breast cancer. This is a test that looks at the expression of 21 different genes that are important in breast cancer um, and integrates the results. We use this test largely in the women who have the best possible prognosis breast cancers, the node-negative receptor-positive breast cancers, where we know we're going to give hormone therapy, and we're struggling with whether we should give chemotherapy. Well, this test was developed and put on the market because of these kinds of results, that women whose test results showed a low risk of recurrence, a low recurrence score, had a really great outcome with hormone therapy alone, even after 10 years. Those who got chemotherapy didn't do any better in this setting. You can see down here the women who had the high risk scores, though, the high recurrence score, had a much poorer outcome with hormone therapy alone, and they were the ones that were the most benefited by chemotherapy. So this is actually a very useful, practical test for patients and for doctors to go forward. Now, all this was based on retrospective information, and so we as taxpayers um, supported a trial from the National Cancer Institute to look at this more carefully in a prospective fashion. And here's that trial. It took those node-negative receptor-positive women, had their tumors tested in this way, 
10,000 of them, as you can see. And those that had the low score got hormone therapy alone. Those that had the high score got chemotherapy and hormone therapy based on those results I just showed you. But the women in the middle were conundrum. Nobody knew exactly what to do with that. And so they were randomized to chemotherapy or not in addition to their hormone therapy. Well, let's look at the results that have come out of this trial. First, what happened to the women where we thought they had a low risk uh, breast cancer and we gave them only hormone therapy? Well, they did great. Um, these are tiny little graphs. You can't see any differences or you can't see anything of note because these women did extremely well. Their outcomes with these low recurrence scores were extraordinarily good, no matter which of our usual breast cancer outcomes you look at, including here, survival, where you see that it's so close to the top that you have to have a blow up to even look at it a little bit further. So this really validates the notion that a low recurrence score breast cancer patient can do um, eradicate, not take chemotherapy. Now, we just heard, though, the results of the most important part of this trial, which is the question about the women in the middle. What should they be doing? Should they take chemotherapy or not? This was just published a couple weeks ago. And I think that the important message that came out of this is that these women with the so-called intermediate scores had equally good results whether they took chemotherapy with their hormone therapy or not. There are two lines here. They're so close together that you can't appreciate it. And so that's allowed us to be able to go back to those patients now and say that if you have these so-called intermediate scores, in fact, you too do not benefit from chemotherapy. So that's a wonderful way of being able to tailor breast cancer therapy to the biology of the breast cancer in a way that in this particular case is going to spare many women extra side effects. And for those who do have the high recurrence score and need to take the chemotherapy, I think you would have a little bit more comfort that it's the right thing to do. Now this is one example. I want to give it to you as a way of how we're thinking about these things going forward and how we hope we'll be able to fine tune um, and to tailor all sorts of therapies to cancer patients. I want to sp spend a moment thinking about um, how biology has helped us with another subset of breast cancer, the HER2 ones. Um, just to let you know that we understand so much about these biological pathways. We understand that HER2 is one of a series of receptors we understand a lot about how these receptors interact to stimulate breast cancer cells to grow. And as a consequence of that, we now have available to us five different agents that target parts of the breast cancer growth process that you see here, either the receptors on the surface or the intracellular machinery um, that allows these signals to be increased and to stimulate breast cancer cells. So a remarkable translation of basic biology into clinical care with new agents for women with this particular kind of breast cancer and no other kind of breast cancer. Does it work? Well, yeah, we've taken it all the way through. Here are some results when you take one of these agents forward into the earliest stages of breast cancer to remind you that women who take Herceptin or trastuzumab with their chemotherapy at 10 years have a better disease-free survival and overall survival than the women who take chemotherapy alone. So this has allowed us to make this a mainstay of therapy for these women with acceptable toxicity, with multiple agents that we're trying to figure out how to integrate, and with actually some question in our minds about whether or not there might be patients where we could again spare them chemotherapy in this combination going forward. Um, so one example again of how we can think about translating pathways into new treatments for individuals with a certain kind of breast cancer. This has led to a big change in how we do clinical trials. So I think that many of you know that we now do much more genomically informed clinical trials. Sometimes they're what we call the basket trials that you can see here. Um, and in a basket trial, what we're doing is looking at a particular genetic mutation that might be seen in a lot of different kinds of cancers and using a targeted therapy towards that mutation, towards that biological change. Sometimes we do umbrella trials. And here we might say, well, lung cancer. There's a lot of different kinds of lung cancers. We're going to think about how we can use different agents and parse out where they might take place. So this really is modifying how we think about our clinical trials. Hopefully no more of those many thousand women trials that I showed you, or men trials, but in fact much smaller, um, very targeted trial populations. And here's an example of how that might work. Um, a, a, a very small trial, a trial that was in only 55 kids and adults. And they had a very specific change in their cancers called a TRAC fusion. Now these TRAC fusions can be found in lots of different kinds of cancers. If you look up here in the various colors, 
You can see here that there's a dozen different kinds of cancers where this was detested by genomic testing. And individuals, young and old, who had any of those kinds of cancers but had that fusion, went on a clinical trial to take this oral agent called Laratrictinib, all right? And what you can see here is the results from this trial. So in what's called a waterfall plot, you can track each individual patient and you can see if their tumor regressed below the line here or if their tumor grew. And you can see that the majority of patients who participated in this trial had tumor regression as a consequence of this targeted agent. Down here, you can see what's called the swimmer's plot, which is how long did it last? Having it be better for two weeks uh, may not be the optimal goal, but you can see here that in many cases it went on for quite some period of time. So this is an example of the kind of trial and the kind of drug development that we are, will increasingly see. That in this particular case, we've been able to demonstrate that this is an effective therapy for a very specific molecular alteration. And it doesn't matter how old the patient is, the youngest one on the trial was treated here, four months old, um, or how, what tumor type, any of these types that you and I just talked about. I also think it's a really great example of teamwork. I, I like this one because we are looking here at an adult oncologist and a pediatric oncologist from our institutions who participated, as well as the pathologist who was so important, of course, in helping us to identify the molecular changes. Um, so such an exciting example of what we call tissue agnostic precision cancer medicine. A lot of our discussion today is going to go around this because I think that Dr. Gilliland might be talking to us about how some of the immunotherapies are also tissue agnostic. I've talked about changes in DNA, but you know there are changes in so many aspects of the tumors. There are proteins, their metabolome, the pharmacogenome, the microbiome, the immunome. And so you can envision that these concepts that I'm talking about are going to take off as we're able to really think about so many different changes that take place in the cancer and so many attributes of the host, because of course the cancer and the host are very tightly tied in these particular um, studies. I also want to point out that much of our work has been done looking at one point in time. Many of you are blood cancer people, so you're used to being able to look at your leukemias over time. We saw a tumor people haven't had that um, opportunity, and so increasingly you will see a focus on novel circulating markers and how we might look at them in a serial fashion. Here's one example of a woman with breast cancer where you might be able to follow her with time with circulating free DNA tests or circulating tumor cells, find molecular changes, and then be able to watch this over time and adjust therapies as a consequence. The first such circulating test has already been approved for treatment of certain kinds of lung cancers, and so the sky is the limit about how we'd be able to take this forward. Finally, I want to spend a moment on how we use what we already know, because we know a lot, but we got to get it out. The first thing is that many of our therapies these days, again, not CAR T cells, which you're here to about, hear about, but many cancer therapies are now oral. Um, and that's a challenge for us in the oncology field because for so long we've been able to give our therapies intravenously and so we know exactly what we're doing. But with oral therapies these days, adherence to therapy is absolutely critical. And here's an example. Again, going back to the breast cancer world and looking at those hormone therapies, which are such an important part for so many breast cancer patients. So these investigators at Kaiser Permanente looked at their database. They looked at all the women that were prescribed the hormone therapy in an appropriate way, and they looked at who filled their prescriptions and who didn't in the Kaiser Pharmacy. So that's how they measured adherence. You know, if you're supposed to take an aromatase inhibitor one pill every day for the next five years, they looked to make sure that people filled their prescriptions on time, and they assumed that if you filled your prescription, you were taking your pill. Well, this is what they found, and this is Kaiser. Everybody has access to health care, right? No problem, presumably, about picking up your prescription, paying for it. So over five years, which was the recommended duration of this hormone therapy, what they found at the top is that about a third of patients stopped taking therapy. Side effects, got tired of it, whatever. Of those that continued, a quarter of them were what were called non-inherent. They didn't take one pill every day. And so at the end of the day, about half the patients ended up taking the prescribed therapy. Well, that's pretty startling. Um, and you know, those are reasonably easy drugs to take. So you might say, does it matter? And in this particular analysis, it really did. Um, because they looked at what happened to those women over time. And what they found was that there was an increase in mortality for the women who were not adherent or who discontinued their therapy early. And you can see this here at the top where you're looking at survival for the women who continued, 
versus the women who did not. Um, and the same thing down here for those who adhered and those who did not. So this is extremely important for us as healthcare providers to make sure that people take what we've asked them to take in an appropriate way. It's also extremely difficult for all of us to keep up, right? Things are changing so rapidly. Um, there's so much going on with the new biology and the new treatments that you and I have been talking about. And so this is a time where we, all of us, need to think about help ourselves in an age of rapid discovery and big data. And you know that pathway-driven medicine has become ever more helpful for us. So the notion that we would have available to us continually updated evidence-based treatment algorithms that would help us with most cancer presentations and also hopefully would take into account the unique comorbidities that some patients might have. If we're gonna use them, you and I, they gotta be right there with us, right, point of care. They've really gotta be patient specific and ideally it's something where you might be able to interact with the patient to use this information. And of course the hope is that ultimately this would result in better performance and we would hope savings in healthcare resources. Which leads me to my other topic about getting things out there um, and that is the increasing uh, emphasis that we have right now on value in cancer care given the cost of cancer care and the potential benefits of cancer care. And of course this really comes into focus when we think about a treatment like CAR T cells. So I wanna put an advertisement out there for a wonderful initiative that's going on in the state of Washington um, led by uh, Scott Ramsey and his team at Fred Hutch um, through something called the High Court, which looks at the cost of cancer care. Um, and this now several year collaboration actually just came out with its first report looking at community cancer care in Washington state, looking at both cost and quality for treatments of several common cancers, breast cancer, colon cancer, um, and lung cancer amongst them, end of life care, emergency room utilization, and so forth. And I think the key features here are that this collaboration, which we have collectively come together around, is the first in the nation to really publicly really report clinic level quality measures and link them to cost in oncology. And I think it's clear indication to me um, that the Hutch and Washington State are really leading in this particular area of data transparency in cancer care. And then finally, it does take a village that this is really an unprecedented collaboration which we've been able to have with our healthcare stakeholders, patients, providers, the researchers, um, the payers, um, all came together to put together this report whose goal is to help us to make sure that we can have the top quality care across our state. So in summary, this is what we're confronting us cancer specialists. We're looking at a time where there's a merger between anatomic staging, histologic staging, and molecular diagnosis um, and how we're gonna be able to put that together. We are definitely looking at an acceleration in the availability and types of therapies. As we've just talked about, there is increasingly an emphasis on quality and new models of care. That's why you're here, is to think about the models of care that are appropriate for CAR-T therapy. And in all of this, of course, a really important thing is for all of us to think about the cost and the value of care, because I, I do believe that if we don't think about this, others will do it for us, and I believe that we are the ones that are the best equipped to tackle these agents or these uh, issues on behalf of our patients. So with that, I want to leave you with the sense that we're pretty focused on what's going on in the U.S. right now, but I want to call your attention to another paper that just came out last week by that same group that looks at um, health metrics, uh, the one I showed you, those maps from the United States. Well, now they've gone back and they've looked at the global burden of cancer across the entire world. Um, and they've got it all encapsulated for you here in one color map. Um, so you can see at the top that in 2016, they gathered all these statistics from almost 200 countries. And they divided up, it's color coded in here into a variety of different kinds of cancers. Um, for the blood cancer audience, the blood cancers are the ones down here, and they tend to be down here at the bottom of the graph. And what they showed here is the incidence of these cancers across the age continuum. And so you can see that some cancers are real common in our kids, and then they go away with time. You can see that some of our common epithelial cancers come up with time. You can see here, if you will, the burden of blood cancers compared to some of the common epithelial cancers across the world. And so it's a really wonderful way to delve down in particular areas that you might be interested in and what the worldwide um, implications are. And finally, incidence is incredibly important, but they also were able to look at cancer mortality. Um, and this reminds us that cancer mortality from a variety of diseases is so important that incidence doesn't always um, get reflected in mortality, thankfully. Um, and it gives you a sense of the relative causes of mortality across the globe and allows us to think 
collectively as a community about what we can do to try to minimize that, not only here, but everywhere. So with that, I thank you so much. I welcome you to Seattle for our meeting. Um, we're so excited that you could be here with us. Thanks.